recording. Okay, cool. So, uh, Gabe Weaver here, I'm senior product manager for the project management group and plan, and I'm joined by by Justin Ferris, group manager for the plan stage. Cool. So, um, I'm going to uh, give Justin a little challenge, and we're going to see how it goes. Uh, part of this is to help illustrate some of the concepts that the Simplify Groups and Project Working Group has been thinking through. So the basic scenario is this, there's Bob, and uh, he needs you to help plan his project. Uh, the project was uh, requested by Ralph, who's the project sponsor slash executive. Bob is a project manager, sorry, typo. Um, and he also has on his team, Jane, Tom, and Taylor. Um, and so the basic objective is this, uh, Ralph brings an important business goal to a project team. He explains the goals, business rules, and a high level overview of the three big modules that need to be completed. Ralph also gives the project team access to three factories that can be tooled to produce the necessary components for the three modules. Ralph, Ralph tasks Bob with creating a project plan and executing against it. Given the business rules, Bob is a bit stuck uh, with where to go and has come to you to ask for help. How would you coach him towards getting a project plan in place that is also transparent and visible to Ralph so he has insights on the current status of the project, if it is on track, and when it is likely to be completed? Understand high level questions about it? Yep. I'm coaching Bob. Bob's going to report to Ralph. So this is, what pro project, yep, this is what project success looks like. Um, there's these three modules and they each uh, require some components to be built. Uh, they're color coded and you'll kind of see why in a second, but they all come from different factories, different places. And they all need to be combined and assembled into these modules. There's also some dependencies where a red component cannot be built until all the necessary yellow components are done first. And a purple component cannot be built until all the necessary blue components are done first. Questions about and that? Just for clarity, orange and green are just independent. They can be built yep. by any factory at any time. Doesn't matter, no dependencies. Not by any factory. So this was where we get into the factories. Each factory has a color-coded workstation where the widgets or components have to be okay. built. Okay. Um, and the basic rule is, uh, we'll get into the business rules in a second, but each factory can coordinate with their workstations. Workstations is where the components or widgets get built. Um, but factories can't talk to each other and each workstation requires quality standards and a workflow to be configured before the workstation can be powered on because it doesn't know what it needs to do until it knows what the workflow is to, to flow through things and like what done done and quality looks like. Can questions about factories Can workstations talk to each other. Uh, no. Can widget one workstation talk to widget two workstation. It cannot. Got it. And I assume, yeah, widget two can't talk to widget three because they're not part of the same factory. Okay, cool, correct. So here are the business rules. A factory contains many workstations as we've shown. A uh, workstation requires a formal work order for each component. So before work can get started on a component, it needs a work order to initiate that. Uh, so the reason for that is um, each factory invoices the project, or each workstation factory invoices the project for the parts it uses, right? Uh, a workstation requires a workflow and quality standards which we talked about. Factories can coordinate with their workstations, but not with each other. And the project plan that Bob creates must live within a factory and be visible to Ralph. So Ralph can track the overall progress without relying on daily updates from Bob. Um, and then lastly, number five, we kind of talked about dependencies. Before a module can be assembled, it needs all the necessary components. Some components are dependent upon other components. So are there... <clears throat> sorry, yeah. can I interrupt the question? Yeah. Back to your slide four, are there, so are there components that I have to build that, oh yeah, okay. So there are components that I can only build in one factory, but have a dependency on components that are built from a completely different factory. Correct. And a business rule is that they can't talk to each other. Correct. Okay. This is like bringing me back to like the SATs where I had to do like hard work <laughs> problems. <laughs> okay, I'm following, I'm following along, keep going. Okay, so the first thing Bob does uh, to get started is he realizes that you can create a, a, a basically a, a workflow and a set of standard qualities that is true for all components. Um, and every component, when it's being built, can go through the same workflow process. And each component follows the same quality standards. Um, but each of the workstations has to be configured manually because that's the way that the factories work. 
Uh, and each, each time uh, it takes about a day to configure each workstation with the workflow and the quality standards, which are really the same across all of them. And so he's gotten this far and now he's not really sure what to do next. Does that make sense? Yep. All right, so giving each station requires a work order. Uh, where would you tell Bob to create his work orders for the different components? Um, yeah, yeah, bring up that. So, you said the work order has to live within the, the project plan has to work live within a factory. That means the work order has to live within each factory, right? Yeah, it can live within a factory or a workstation, either one. Yeah. Um, and sorry, go back to the question number eight or slide eight specifically. Where you create the work order for different components? I mean, I guess you'd create the work order um, at the factory level or the widget level. He's going to have to do it manually for each one, which is tedious, right? Mm -hmm. um, and anytime you said they're all the same or it's the same construct for all of them. So it's also tedious if he has to change something at some point. But given the model, like I think the only way to do it is to, to be able to, or given the business rules, the only way to do it is to have to recreate the work order for each component at the component level, at the widget level. Okay, so what you're saying is each workstation has its own work orders that gets created. I think so. I okay. mean, just if I understand it correctly, yeah, that's the only way you can do it. <laughs> that makes sense. So uh, optimal, but the, I think that would work. It would work, you're right. Uh, and given the project plan needs to live in a factory, where would you create it such that Ralph, who's the project sponsor, can get visibility into the progress of the overall project and work orders without nagging Bob for status updates? Yeah, I figured this question was coming and I was my like brain was melting trying to figure out what to do because your project plan really should be, I mean, if you go up a slide, like this is kind of your project plan, like in a, in a visual representation, like you need each of these modules to exist to call the project complete. But those modules consist of work that's created in different factories and with the dependency model, there's dependencies that traverse those factories. So right. it's like, I don't know, like, I don't know. Um, my, the like naive answer is like, you'd have to do a lot of duplication. Like you'd need to create the project plan, the same project plan in factory A, B, and C so that you have the visibility of those dependency maps. But then as soon as something changes in one factory, like a status changes in one factory, like widget, one blue widget got completed or whatever, like factory C is not gonna know that or what's the, I forget the dependency map, but whatever, the factory that can build the widget that's dependent, has a dependency on it, can't start building it because it doesn't necessarily know that it's been done yet or whatever, right? so, so like well, that's yeah. a mess. <laughs> so Bob would have to pr pretty much go and get, go to each factory, then look at each workstation to see if the work, work order has been done then update the duplicated project plan within each factory and then manually know how to like tr translate that within each factory? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I, and I feel bad for Bob, but I think so. And that's the only way yeah. I can think to do it. Cause if you put the, if you put the project plan in, if you just pick one factory, say factory a is where the plan is, Bob's still going to have to manually enter the work orders. Like it, it's going to create, maybe even create more of a bottleneck because his project plan is only in one place but those factories need to operate off of something. And so he's having to manually create those work orders constantly where if you're building, it's a naive example, if you're building like five yellow widgets, he shouldn't have to like constantly have to copy and paste and move stuff over. It's suboptimal either direction you go, I guess. So it's like either duplicate them across all factories or put them in one factory, but then he's going to have to constantly be keeping them in sync manually or, um, or constantly be giving like two like low level of orders to the the widget workers, right? Yep, makes sense. Uh, and I guess this is another question: given the amount of duplication, manually setting up the same workflow and quality standards within each workstation, what would you change about the factory to make this more efficient? 
Um, so if you could change the factory so that you you didn't like the one factory so you didn't have to duplicate quite as much, what would you do? Well, I would probably make it so that I would combine all the factories into one, right? Um, sure. And make it so that each factory can produce the same widgets. Um, you could also create like a parent factory, I guess, that has um, that contains the child factories and then have the project plan live there and have like a configurable workflow layer that then gets auto updated below, you know? Um, but in some way, like you can't have, you need to break, you need to change it so you don't have the hard boundaries between each factory. So maybe like uh, take this workflow that's down here and maybe put it up in and factory A exactly. or, and so that way these inherit it and then maybe even puts a wrap around all these. I guess, factories. yeah, small, a small, if we're talking about like iteration, a small iteration would be make the workflow live at the factory level and then it's okay. just inherited, but a better, more complete solution is to combine these in some capacity. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's kind of the next question is if you can change anything about the behavior of factories, including adding new contracts or layers to help you solve the problems of having a single source of truth project plan, what are some things you might try to change? We talked about a few of them. Is there anything else if you could, if you could literally do anything here to make it so that you could have a single source of truth, what would you do? Well, I guess like, what's the point of on individual workstation or a factory in and of itself? Like if, if maybe, maybe the better question is like, what's the point of the factories? Like, could we just have a single factory that was able to contain the project plan, the quality standards, the workflow, since those are all duplicate duplicative. Um, and then the individual workstations just hang off of that um, to simplify it. Um, the other thing, I, if, if we didn't do that, I would make it so that these things can interop better, right? Like yep. break the rule or the business rule that says they can't talk to each other and make it so that these things aren't so specialized that they have the ability to, to communicate with each other um, and report back either status or a change. I think you still need to move the quality standards and workflow up a level. That's probably a non-starter. But if you still had some separation for some reason, you need a way to like break through that, like punch through the firewall and enable them to communicate with each other. Yeah. That makes sense. So um, let's think about the kind of going down the path of let's say wrapping this with another thing that lets you put all the things that, you know, let's yeah. say you combine all these things, whatever, into one thing that has all these workstations. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a step, step further. Let's assume that what we just walked through was just Ralph's part of the project, but it's actually part of a bigger initiative spanning multiple zones and, and factories. So like a zone is a wrapper we can use it as that. Um, okay. And Ralph has a boss and there's uh, that Ralph's boss wants to see what the project plan is where the, in order to complete the project, you have to have work that spans uh, a zone A, which maybe might have the workflows for, uh, you know, the single workflows for all the different factories and whatnot. And then zone B also has uh, factories and, and widget stations and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out Ralph's boss wants to see when the project is going to be done. So it needs to punch in deeper. Yeah, I, there's, I, I see it as two things. One, you could continue to add wrappers, but I don't know how far you're gonna take me down that rabbit hole of like, now, now Ralph's boss has a boss and Ralph's boss's yeah. boss is boss is boss. Um, so, but whatever, like maybe a path is that now you have a more like a, a super parent, grandparent wrapper here that sure. combines on A and B. Alternatively, maybe a, a problem we're identifying is that the project plan is attached to one of these factories. Like maybe that's a problem. Maybe the project plan needs to be uh, adjacent to sitting outside of the zones or sitting outside of the factories so that it can be reviewed, viewed, edited, updated, kept up to date, agnostic of where it belongs. And that way Ralph, his boss, his boss, his boss, Bob, et cetera, have, all have access to it. But then at the same time, it needs to be able to push work orders, I'm assuming work orders into the individual factories and the individual workstations in zone A or zone B. It also needs to know the outputs or the, the success or failures of the creation of the widgets from each 
workstation as well. So there needs to be a connection there nonetheless if we pull it outside of the factory, but that probably, if this continues, that probably is the direction I would want to pursue if I still have like a magic wand and can change things. Sure, the, throw, throw this in the, in the mix. Um, because of, uh, you know, business and security measures and kind of mitigating risks, um, let's say you uh, have something, the project plan outside of both these zones, um, but Bob only has access to zone A and he only can see things maybe within one factory in zone B, but he doesn't, he, he can't access anything outside of those for security reasons. Uh, how, would, okay. how would he see the project plan? Right. But Ralph can see everything or Ralph's boss can mm -hmm. see everything. Because they're theoretically in the bigger wrapper out around these two. Yeah. Um, that's where the interop thing comes in. I think you need the ability to have Ralph or Bob, excuse me, Bob's part of his, the project, the meta project plan, like Bob's project plan. That's a, that's a, a subset of a much larger project plan to exist with some independence, whether it's under a factory or under the zone in zone A or whatever. Um, but him be able to see the other project plan or the other parts of the project plan that he can see and be and let those two things talk to each other. Cause I assume the reason why he has visibility into some part of B is that that's where a dependency lives. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he needs part of his project plan in that's maybe inside of zone a to reference the dependency that's inside of zone B without giving him all, you know, eyes and access to everything. Right. So there has to be some interoperability between these two things in that world. Um, Correct. I mean, I yeah. think that's the only way to solve it. So yeah. <laughs> how does this apply to GitLab? Um, like if, and the things that we're trying to solve is you think about like a zone, zones like a group, right? Right now, um, a factory is yeah. a subgroup. Let's say that a workstation is a project. Yep. Um, and these all have slightly different behaviors. Uh, and so like w one of the things that we don't do in GitLab anywhere is, uh, factories can't talk to each other. Workstations can never talk to each other. Zones can never talk to each other about anything. Um, period. So like, that's just the way the inheritance model works. Um, and so as we've been trying to think about how to solve some of the problems uh, that we're facing here, and this is really like a usability problem and also customers can't use uh, GitLab for planning at scale because you can't get those visibility and you can't punch through uh, like kind of neighbors uh, and link things together. Um, we've been spending some time thinking about how to solve for this, but we also like put some additional constraints on the, whatever solution we would come up with. And one of them would be like iterating on existing organizational constructs. Um, so take what we have and make it better. Um, don't just build something new. Uh, Second constraint was delivering tangible customer value every release. So don't go in a hole for a long time and build something new. And then basically number three, force somebody or customers to migrate into this thing or cause a bunch of disruptions. So another constraint is no migrations or disruptions for end users. Uh, and then the fourth constraint was uh, no hard requirement for UI changes, except those that will improve overall usability to drive SAS improvements. So like, how can we fix all these problems without uh, also at the same time requiring us to make a substantial amount of UI changes. So with those in mind, do you want to uh, me to walk through sort of like how we created an iteration plan to maybe yeah. approach this problem? Yeah, sure, cool. Um, so the reason why you can't infinitely nest things up or I guess suppose you can, eventually you're gonna run into the problem of you can't go any higher than an instance, right? right? So even if you were to make everything kind of work and from that standpoint, at some point you will get to the level where an instance can't talk to another instance, which you can consider just like a zone. So like that kind of is a, is a like hard constraint due to the way, like in, in terms of how far you can scale the thing. So the first thing that we talked about doing was, you know, groups have certain features, projects have certain features. Uh, you said it earlier, like what would it look like to just like combine everything and, and kind of simplify it that way. And so, what we came up with is this idea of creating, uh, for this example, it's a space, uh, but really it's behind the scenes and nobody sees it. Um, for everything that somebody sees, it's a group. We can call it whatever we want in the code, doesn't matter. Um, and, and what this does is it lets us wrap a group with uh, 
this new kind of construct that's completely invisible to the end user and create a um, kind of project that's also invisible, but then start to expose features like a wiki within the group, right? So the, the job of the space is basically to resolve resources from a project or group that are both live within the space. So uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Just to clarify. So you're using your example from our exercise earlier. In, if, in this world, uh, this would solve for the problem where, say, the individual factories can't talk to each other and in and, and turn the individual workstations can't talk to each other. If they were all part of this space, then ostensibly they could communicate with each other because they're part of this invisible to them. They, they still are a factory. It's the same factory that they've always been. Right. Um, but now they're a part of this sort of meta space that enables them to interop and have communication and permissions and visibility between each other. Is that a fair way to think of this? Uh, not, not quite there yet with this illustration. Think about okay. this is like, um, I'm going to create a widget, uh, basically workstation inside of the factory, but it, it like, it's basically putting a, a workstation inside the factory level. So if we want to create, let's say a work order, uh, yeah. and we want to have a widget workstation and it all lives at the factory level and not below it. So, Got it. Okay. so instead of like having two disparate things, you can now have one thing that does all of the things within the factory. So it's the I first step it. to like merging things together. I see. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and then the next thing, like you, we, we can extend, continue to like expose uh, features that only were available, like in the example at the workstation level within the factory level. So the factory can now do that. So without my quality to. standards or what were the two, the quality standards and the workflow plan, those yep. don't have to be hung off of the, individual workstation they can hang off of the group or the space in this case Correct. be duplicate du not be duplicative because you only have one of them but apply to all of their potential workstations that live within yep. that group got it and so we're not creating anything new we're, we're basically taking what is a workstation behind the scenes and and exposing the features within it available so that the the, the factory or the group can use them Cool. Okay. Um, and so continuing down this example and GitLab speak, you could do this with wiki approval rules issues. Those are all things that customers yep. were requested at the, at the group level. So once you kind of like do this at, at, within the group, you then inverse this and you do this at what, what is the workstation level? So you wrap a workstation or a project in GitLab speak, uh, with a space, and then you create a shadow or behind the scenes, uh, group or factory. So what we're essentially doing is making eventual parity between what would be a group and a project or a factory and workstation. So there is no difference between them. We're not really addressing the communication across them right now, but just make like working towards, there is no difference between a factory and a workstation because they can both all do the same thing. Right. So this solves problem one where Bob's at the Bob level, before you added the Ralph's boss, right? Correct. This allows Bob to much more easily report to Ralph this and Ralph to see what the status of the project is to know what components are working well with the, without which with each other, excuse me, where the dependencies lie, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And so I could create a work order at the, uh, at, at the top level group and it could all flow down to one of the to workstations, you know, or you could just have your workstation and in, inside of the factory and not have a separate thing. Like you don't need or your you if want. widget yellow widgets complete a work order gets automatically generated for the blue widget to get created or whatever, because of yep. the dependency that's mapped. Yeah. Cool. Yep. That sort of thing. Okay. So eventually you can uh, remove what we currently call a factory or a workstation and call it something new because it, not quite a factory. It's not quite a workstation. It's more of like a combined super, I can do anything within this space kind of thing. And we're not making decisions about what it should be called in the product at this point. We're just using this as a placeholder to say it can be called something. And this is where, you know, if we want to make the change to call it something and have it be the same thing we can, we could leave it being a group and a project. It's really kind of up to what would this giving ultimate flexibility to UX to drive some sus improvements based on what, would work for customers without basically requiring uh, them all to happen at the same time. So then eventually- that, So real quick though, back to one slide. Yeah. At this point, um, or at that point, you you don't have to, like the UI hasn't necessarily changed for the user. Like they could be unaware of this change aside from the fact that 
the permissions model or the, the, the interop between subgroups and projects is now much easier, right? Like there's not a yeah. groups like they become something different. There's not another, they don't have, they don't have to know that there's a space. Nope. They don't, they don't know that there's a space, a new parent object or whatever that's containing these things. Right. Yep. They upgrade to 13, six, and then all of a sudden they have wiki approval roles and issues that they can create it at the group level. That's right. it. Got it. Cool. Um, and then same thing when we get to the project, you know, they wake up one release or upgrade so and they can create the epic iter epics and iterations and all the things that you can do at the group level now that you can't at the project. Yep. Um, yeah. So then over time, instead of having these shadow things forever, we start to extract those features out and make them either be kind of more independent of us, of a group or project entirely, or they basically will eventually just live within whatever we call the new thing. And we have all the features and it's essentially a one-to-one -one parity between what is now a group or a project. Um, Got it. So, so this, long, long term, the idea then is like groups and projects sort of cease to exist, but because you've driven parity between them with this invisible object, um, you now have the option to basically turn them off and say, no, you just have features at these different levels. And then you construct your organizational hierarchy how you want to, and you can do anything at any level of that hierarchy, basically. Yep. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, and then one of the other things that we have been uh, working through is like right now we have this instance up here that has some settings that are only there um, that aren't available in a group or a project. Uh, and so this has led to some disparity between self-managed uh, experiences and GitLab.com or our SaaS offering because the, we don't allow uh, any of our SaaS customers to be at instance admins, which means that they don't get access to a lot of the things that are up here that they actually might want to have access to. So another thing that we've been looking at solving um, is, is like, how do we kind of look at this now at the instance level and start to bring some of these features that are the instance level down into uh, a space, right? So it could be, it could be a group. It could, we could call it whatever we want. Let's just assume it's a group or we could call something in an organization. But at the end of the day, it's not creating a new object. It's just making UI changes because behind the scenes, everything is powered by a space, right? Or will be. Um, and so it's really What's just a, moving. Yeah. Oh, keep going. Sorry. I mean, no, it's really just moving features that would be in the instance into this now kind of universal, uh, right. grouping of features. What is it out of, out of curiosity? What's an example of one of those instance level features today that say exists in self-managed, but SaaS users don't have access to. <clears throat> oh, I came across this interestingly. It's really just setting for uh, delayed uh, deletion. So you can schedule, Basically, within a group, you can enable the uh, ability to uh, delay deletion of a group or of a project until a certain time period. Right now, it's default to seven days. So uh, group admins can turn that on and off, but they can't specify the number of days. That's an instance admin only setting, right? Got it. So, uh, which is kind of causing confusion because some people want to be able to do that. Uh, within their groups on gitlab.com but they can't so they can't change the duration and it leads to this like kind of weird thing where there's not the level of flexibility that you get with self-manage because there's only one instance on gitlab.com correct gitlab.com yeah Got that's it. right okay um so the the basic idea is here is like you can start moving some of these things down where you know within this organization or you could leave it as a group it really it's like try not to pay attention to the names pay attention to the fact that it's the same th same shape as everything else that we just talked about. Um, you can continue moving things in and then eventually um, we can make an instance an identity provider. And so right now uh, users belong to the instance level uh, and they also can belong to a third party external identity provider. But a lot of this stuff that happens within the instance itself. And so whenever, for example, gitlab.com, um, somebody needs to make some changes, some, some Haml or some SAML like things that uh, and reset basically some settings that only admin instance admins can do. They have to open a support ticket, which then gets pinged back into like, you know, the infra team to make all these changes and to fix all of these things instead of allowing uh, individual folks to self-service their own like users. Um, and so the idea is here is you create this identity provider where now these spaces or, you know, kind of groupings of features can use either GitLab's identity provider for the users, or they can also uh, connect in a third-party identity Got provider. Active Directory or SAML. Yep, and all that spit, those settings live also within the space itself. So we're basically yep. moving things that only admins could do before and, and making it available for, for space, these admins to be able to do. 
Um, so like if an enterprise cool. configured, you know, some service now authorization approval matrix that can be automatically wired into .com to their instance or their organization, yep. their space without having to manually create yep. and delete users. Yeah. Cool. And this is exactly the same thing. Sid proposed instance level groups. This is the same thing as an instance level group or uh, Melissa also proposed organizations. They're, they're, they're the exact same thing. They're just being called different things in different issues. Yep. <laughs> so it's important to point out yeah, that yeah, there is no it's nomenclature. It's not. Yep. Um, cool. But what this, what this opens the door for is allowing us to do uh, more or less federated um, GitLab. So we'll talk about like the, the relationship thing that will let you poke holes across the different things in just a second. But what you will eventually be able to do is if, since every like uh, grouping shares the same shape, there's no differences between the shapes at all whatsoever. Um, right. You, it's then makes it easier to do geo replication uh, because the data structure is the same across all of them. Uh, you can also more easily do federation because the data shapes the same across all of them. And if you want to use the GitLab identity provider from an instance, you can use that uh, across all instances. So like you could use one GitLab instance identity provider to power others, or you could continue to use like an external one, but it sort of kind of sets the stage for federation, which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, and then the last thing that we're still working on a little bit in terms of an iteration plan, but it's this idea where, um, you instead of a strict hierarchy uh, we create the ability to connect uh, these spaces objects to one directly to one another uh, and what this would let you do is say i want to share my work orders from this space to this other space right you can more or less push those objects from this space into this other space um, this is like the most complex part i think of the working group and we're still working through the iteration plan here um, but the idea is, and I can bring up this kind of diagram is a, is a better way to visualize it, but assuming you have these different spaces um, and you have iterations and epics and all these things, these planning objects across them, uh, which you could consider work orders from our example, um, you connect space A to space B, which would be like the kind of factories that can't talk to each other. And um, maybe space B wants to push uh, objects into space A and space A wants to uh, basically or space B wants to pull objects from space A. Um, it's a it's it's like a directed acyclical graph relationship instead of a strict hierarchy, which yep. then features can follow and you can actually build the uh, across factories or across zones or across instances even um, kind of relationships for resources and how they can be pulled and pushed into one another. And we'll have to come up with a different word than pull or push because that's kind of not messing through with uh, merge requests. But yeah. you kind of get the idea of the, we're working through like what would it look like to move to a relationship model like this that gave that kind of flexibility of uh, letting these different um, factories um, and spaces talk to one another. So, um, Can you, I think I know the answer to this, but I'd love for you to voice over this and clarify, but can you give me kind of a quick overview of um, sort of why, well, so we're, we're in this like forced inheritance model today, right? In terms mm -hmm. of organization. Uh, it looks like we, through this, you have a path to move towards a DAG. For those of us who aren't super familiar with these things, can you give a quick high level overview? Like why, why are we on a forced inheritance model today? What are the benefits of it? Um, why do we need to move to a DAG? What is a DAG and why do we need to move to it? I think I have an understanding, but I'd love for you to talk to Yep. You. Yep. So the forced inheritance or the way that it works now is great because um, you can configure things in one place and then everything downstream can inherit them. You can also have things that are downstream that can kind of flow upward. So an issue is a good example, right? If I have uh, my, let's say I create a work order using the example and, and one of my workstations, that's immediately visible in the factory level without any extra work. So it automatically shows up there by default the factory has visibility into it. And so it can do kind of roll up reporting and it gets notified by the things that are happening downstream. Yep. Um, membership is another example where I can add, add Bob and his team to a factory and all the workstations below it get access to it automatically, which is great. So there's like a lot of benefits to it, but the, the drawbacks are um, you can't, like factories can't talk to each other. And so right. how this is manifesting, yeah. And how this is manifesting self and customers um, like a, a really simple example um, to say is uh, we have three top level groups or we have three top level factories, right? Uh, I have issues or work orders as I'm assigned to and each of my factories um, and each factory can see them, 
right? But my manager, Bob, in this example, he can't create a project plan and see all of the work orders across all the factories in one board. Because they're in, top different, groups. they're in different top level groups. Correct. And so you can go the, you can go the next step up and be like, okay, well then if we're going to create another group above that, like we were talking about and you showed the diagram where I did with it be like an organization or something like that. Um, the problem comes in the fact that uh, organizations don't want to give Bob access to the organization level. They don't want him to see everything at the organization level. They want to give him least privileged access to just the things that he needs to see from the factories that he needs to see it from. And right. Which is why you have to have a different way of expressing your relationships across your factories. Instead of just rolling everything up and pushing it down, you need to have more flexibility so that um, maybe uh, Bob creates his, his project plan in this products top level group, which or group level, right? Um, and then there's issues in, he gets, he gets access to the customer related thing and to the libs thing. And maybe there's even another uh, top level group over here that he shouldn't have access to. Uh, but this will allow them to create the connection across these three so that the, the, basically the, the objects or the issues can flow freely between them in a very prescriptive way. It's sort mm -hmm. of like the next iteration of doing a forced inheritance by making it more flexible. So you still get the inheritance by default when you create a subgroup or a subspace, right? But you can also, within your top levels, be more expressive about um, defining how, how data can move between the two. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have one more meta question, I guess, back to your iteration plan. But if you have other things to yep. share, we could talk about that first. That's it for now. OK, so back to your iteration plan, if you don't mind pulling up the sure. on the slides. Um, so kind of like that first step, if you can find that slide. Like, I'm curious. The first iteration, yeah. So the next one, yeah, next slide. So, what would be the first thing? Like, what's the first? So in GitLab, forgetting the analogy for a bit. Like, what's the first thing you would ship? Like, if you, if the entire plan stage and manage stage were tasked with working on this in thirteen six, like, what's the, what's the really supposed item say? Uh, I, it depends on how much we get done. I need to talk to engineering about that. But in the early proof of concept we did where we actually created this sort of wrapper behind the scenes and created this phantom project. Um, I think Alex worked on this. He spent a day or two and was able to get uh, all of the group level features working or available. So wikis issues. Oh, so so um, he did this like in a proof of concept or some mock environment or something like that. Yep. Yep. He actually, he, he worked on a code and we'll do a demo of that separately, but he wrote the code to make this work at a high level Okay, and it worked, um, which was really cool. And so I think the first release post we would target basically wikis, I think are not all the way there being moved to the group. Uh, if they're ready, then maybe not that, but issues certainly is one of them. Uh, merge request approval rules is another one that is uh, it been highly requested by customers. So I think I would target those two. Um, and the interesting thing about this too is like when you look at this, you would think there might be a lot of permissions conflicts between a group and a project. Yeah. Right. But when we looked across the two tables, we only found like one very small one. And it was who could set uh, environment variables at the group level versus the project level. And that's resolvable. Okay. So the first thing would be, and I've gotten feedback from customers is, Hey, I have all my repos down here, my projects. I want to do all my planning at the group level. And right now I don't want to create a project to do that. So just let me manage my issues at the group level. Yeah, that seems like a, that seems like a pretty, uh, as the planned group manager, that seems like a pretty nice, uh, nice win for low effort. So the, but you could think of it simplest, sim, in a simple way of like there, I know of like merge request approval rules or wikis or whatever, like there's a dozen things on teams backlogs across all of GitLab that are you know, X feature at the group level. So it's basically like ship two of those, just do it slightly differently. Instead of copying the functionality from the project level to the group level, you're applying this model through Alex's proof of concept. Um, and then you, you ship that feature, but you're it, behind the scenes of the customer, it, it's happened very differently than what we've done in the past when we've done this type of work. Correct. And also um, the interesting thing is like, I think uh, Marcus was saying about the wiki that they're only at like 80% feature parity right now. So when we do duplicate things or move things from project to group, we always miss things. And you sure, because you're have... having to go feature by feature, line by line to figure out what capabilities and functionality you need to 
port over, yep. for lack of a better term. To exactly, and that, another one would be uh, prioritize labels right now. So we have group labels, but you can't set label priority at the group, right. uh, which means that every every project below has to go sort of like create your own workflows. Every project has to then go and configure the priority labels from the group labels. And so we would be able to get group label priority labels for free. I mean, there's a ton of things that kind of open the door. Um, there's with really, when we looked at this, almost no UX changes. Like the only thing we would have to change for exact, if we created issues at the uh, group level, you could do that is we would have to change the issue list so that it defaulted uh, or when you're in the group, for example, um, it would default to the, uh, to the group you're in to create the, uh, new issue instead of right now you have to right. go pick which project so oh, yeah. basically like very tiny little things like that would be the only required UX changes. yeah very cool okay so depending on engineering capacity and everything but the, the simple answer is potentially take one or two or a few of those things and follow through on this path and in a single month ship that that's great yep and it's also sort of de-risking it too because we find after that small iteration that this doesn't scale then we haven't we can figure out you you haven't migrated it. customers in a way that is a one-way door migration Correct. you haven't right you have the and you have the ability to compare like was that actually faster and more efficient from an engineering perspective do we get the usability that we felt like we would get because you've done we, we've done a half dozen that i'm aware of types of efforts where we've moved features from the project to the group level. So correct. Uh, makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, I don't have any other questions. I don't think. Cool. Well, thank you for walking through this with me and uh, being a guinea pig for my uh, helping Bob plan his project example. I think it illustrated things sort of well, I hope in a simple way. And uh, we'll continue to release some videos that kind of show some of these POC demos and uh, also try to kind of convey some of these more complicated things in a simple way. So if you have suggestions, if you watch this, you have questions, um, there is a Slack uh, channel that uh, for the working group that I'll post in the YouTube video and feel free to uh, get in touch there. Cool. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Justin.